Welcome to With You Every Step, the solo travel podcast that explores, explains, and hopefully inspires you to travel the world by yourself. I'm your host, Michelle Lee. Being an athlete, I have always struggled with injuries and pain. Since retirement, it's much worse. I know most athletes have the same issues. I have tried every type of massage, physio, chiro, myro. Sophia Bush recently shared an Insta story with someone who has helped her pain and her body in a way that I'd never heard of before. They spoke about the best way to look after the body on a plane and while traveling. I was so intrigued that I was seeking more. So I reached out to Anna Ray to give me more. Anna is here to share her brilliance. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your crazy busy schedule to be on with you every step. It is my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Anna, can you tell me a little bit about what you do? Yes. I happen to be in a, it's really funny. People ask me to try to be succinct and I, it's hard for me to do it because most people don't have a point of reference, but I like to tell people that I'm in the business of body care kind of like skincare, but my focus of body care is this unique special material and a a system in the body that is called fascia. And it kind of is an evolution in our current concepts of like health and wellness and diet and fitness, uh, because it's a little more broad, kind of like holistic medicine. It kind of broadens our perspective of literally what the body needs and how you're going to care for it. So I like to say that I'm a little bit in biotech because fascia is a biological substance and an organic compound constructed from different stuff in our bodies. And I also ended up through my own journey of healing with pain, discovered this specific technology that is geared towards fascia. Fascia has two different, well, do you want me to go into like what fascia is? Yeah. But firstly, I just want to ask you, what do you call what you do? Is it called like yoga? So we ca- we call it GST. Yeah. It started off, it's weird. It started off as like, I didn't know what I was doing differently. I was a Pilates teacher and had studied a bunch of different methods of Pilates and yoga and physio type therapy, like applied kinesiology And then I needed to name my company and I was looking for like, uh, I knew I had something intellectually that I needed to protect. So I talked to a lawyer and they're like, well, you just need to name it something that no one would be able to like steal or compete that has like a non-compete. So you can't name it like Coca-Cola or you can't name it like something that is associated with something else. So I didn't really understand intellectual property. So I just named it. GST, which was stood for grace so metamorphic technique. Weirdly enough, my name in Hebrew means grace. And when I had so much pain and so much restriction in my body, when I saw myself dance, the only thing that felt right was that I was still really graceful, even the way that I cut through space. And it felt like that as I was learning how to heal my body, that it was kind of like this grace from source or God, however you want to say that, that I was able to find this way through this extreme excruciating and extraordinary kind of journey of pain. So so metamorphic means soma in Greek means body. Meta means changing, obviously, and morphic is shape. And what I noticed is that as I was working with fascia, I radically went through incredibly, almost like unconscionable changes in my physique. So I like gained an inch and three quarters in my leg length, I, which is un you know, heard of. Mm. I changed like my proportions so significantly that I changed sizes in my clothes. So as I was healing my pain, I was morphing this body shape and I didn't understand how until I did more research onto what fascia was. I didn't want it to be a method because I didn't want it to be dogmatic. And when it started to spread, I didn't want people to be like, oh, it has to be like this. That's what got me into trouble with a lot of my my uh, teaching of the body, for example, like I know in sports, they're very like astringent with like, this is the way you do things. And this is how you do it. And Mm -hmm. like rules and logics and dance is the same way. Like you have to keep your hips down and you have to keep your ribs closed and you have to. So all that rigidity in motion made me crazy because it contributed to a lot of the vicing and pain. 
when you understand what fascia is, it's easier to explain. But the point was I wanted to have a terminology that was like accurate to what I was doing, what I felt about it. And then it just became completely like too complicated. So I just called it GST. And that's what it's been, but it's hard to explain it to people because it's not really like, oh, related to fascia or something. I didn't really know what I was doing was with fascia for a long time. Do you know what GST stands for in Australia? Yes, the gross sales tax. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. Canadians also love it. They're like, gross sales tax? I don't get it. I'm like, no. Nah. <laughs> Anywhere where the crown is, I'm like, it's not what it is. But it's really, I know. I, I should have named it something different. And in hindsight, I probably would have. But I was 20. And they were threatening me with, you want it to be totally unique and original that no one can copy and that is trademarkable. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I'll just call it this. And little did I, and, and they're like, well, that's long. And I said, we'll just call it GST body for short. Yeah. And they're like, okay. So now people are like, why didn't you call it that? And I'm like, well, Pilates is called Pilates because of a man's name. And I didn't want it to be known as ant array technique because I also wanted it to live outlive me. Like I didn't want it to be associated with me really. I think that it will last for generations what this has discovered because fascia is so new and so cutting edge. Like it can't just be like this method that you do because fascia by nature is living, breathing, vital, you know, amorphic and like constantly changing and adaptive. And so I was like, okay, I want to capture that in a name, I guess is what it was. Okay. So can you explain what the fascia is in our body? Yes. Fascia is the material that makes up the connective tissue in your body. So fascia and connective tissue are oftentimes used synonymously. But if you think about fascia, for those who don't know, fascia is like the fabric that makes up and holds your body together. So it's like the cotton of a t-shirt or the linen of your pants. It's literally a type of tissue material. And it's composed of elastin and collagen are the primary ingredients with a lot of water and a lot of hyaluronic acid. And as a material, it's really significant because it's a pseudoplastic, it's called a non-Newtonian pseudoplastic fluid as a complex thing. But what it does is that it is a solid that behaves like a fluid under stress. Stress meaning not emotional stress only, but it actually behaves like a fluid when exposed to forces, like when you're running or when you're sitting or when you're twisting or when you pick up something, when it's under a force load, it behaves like a fluid. So it's kind of an interesting material substance that we always think of the body as being a solid. But in fact, most of the body is a fluid, both in its water composition and in its um, content of fiber through fascia because of what fascia is. And then Fascia, also people don't understand like, well, what is it? How do I picture it? What does it do? And fascia as a substance comprises its own holistic body system. And the way you can think about it is that your body is a compilation of many different systems, your muscular skeletal system, your endocrine system for hormone and chemical experiences. You have your nervous system, your digestive system. So you have all of these systems and fascia actually makes up its entire own body system, complete with its own organs. The difference is, is that uh, while your digestive system has a mass organs like your liver and your intestines and your colon and your stomach, those are massed organs. Mm -hmm. Fascia tissue has spread out organs, but that's the way that cells organize. So this connective tissue system, it's called the CNT, sorry, connective tissue, CTN, S, CTS, all the organs of it is what connects the body together. And so it's all very much spread out. So you have a way the cells of fascia organize in your muscular skeletal system. And so that's the organ of, and it's called myofascia, or you have the fascia that is part of your organs, and that's called your viscera. And then you have the organ of the way that your body like gives substance. So for example, most people don't think about how do your veins stay in place? How do you keep your nerves running through into your muscles? They're not all in the muscles. They are in a substance like a jelly mm -hmm. called your ECM. It's called your extracellular matrix. And so your ECM does a lot of different things. But one of the things it does is it, it beefs up your body. It adds shape and size. 
the thing that keeps your veins suspended in your body is the ECM. It also happens, it's kind of like, think about fruit in a bowl of jello. Mm -hmm. That's what the ECM does for your organs and for your nerves, all the different things. It also has a big way that it creates, it's a supply organ. It's the fascial supply organ. So it gives all the nutrients to all your cells in your body as they're busy uh, living and giving you energy and stuff. So the connective tissue system is extremely important, but it's been widely overlooked because it's spread out everywhere. So if you think about like when you, if you wanted to think about the way that it looks, it's kind of like Halloween cotton candy or, or Halloween cotton cobwebs that you stretch out okay, and pull yep. everywhere. Yep. And it looks a little bit different in terms of the type of material. So you have some loose material that's more like loosely woven that is on the surface and superficial. And then you have more densely packed types of fabric on the insides underneath you. So it's kind of like your packaging material, but it's everywhere. It's in your brain. It's in your eyes. It's in your kidney, your all your organs. It's in your myofascia, which is why it gets a lot of attention in your sports medicine mm -hmm. and in different types of movement methods. It's really significant, but most people don't know. It's always been seen as kind of frivolous and not very significant because people were so enamored with the large mast organs that they weren't looking for it. They would cut through it to get to the muscle to fix or to get to the heart to do the surgery. And they always, it's called fascial connective tissue, but they don't see it as this holistic organ that has a very significant thing. And this is where the technology comes in, not to bore you, but. <laughs> no, not at all. I find it so fascinating. I'm, I'm visualizing my body in a different way right now. <laughs> good, good. I want people to do this because it's so fascinating. You don't have to learn all the comp compartmentalized parts anymore. You can learn fascia and it, and it touches in on everything. So previously fascia was always kind of considered part of the autonomic nervous system except when it came into the myofascia, which is your muscular skeletal system. You can choose to fire a muscle. You can choose to direct force through your speed or your velocity of motion. What's really interesting is that recent research is showing that fascia's cells can contract similar to a muscle contraction, okay? So what that means is that instead of fascia as just being part of your autonomic nervous system, which is stuff you can't control, that's what we try to influence indirectly through good diet and exercise. We're trying to like boost the body's immune system, which is largely autonomic. So we use the very limited scope of somatic nervous system activity to try to influence it. But this big technological research is showing that it, you can contract on command fascia like you would a muscle. Why is that significant is that fascia goes places where muscles don't. Using the technology of what the connective tissue system is, you know how the digestive system metabolizes food and extracts nutrients so that you can have energy to go out and move and have the you know nutritional requirements to boost your immune system and support all the other things. The connective tissue system's primary role, like the endocrine is for hormones and the nervous system is for, you know, brain communication and electrical animation of the system. The connective tissue system's major goal is all about energy, metabolism, and interface with motion and synchronization. So it's almost like people should know that the connective tissue system's like your smart grid. It's what plugs in to life. It's what plugs you into and monitors all the different energetic frequencies that are happening simultaneously in your physiology, your mind, and your brain, all the way into physical force that's coming in. And so it's like trying to digest external force that's coming into you. And it's also trying to synchronize the motions of like your heart beats with a pulse, right? And that sends a verberation through the tissues. Well, right next door, you have a lung that's expanding with a different type of motion. Fascia's job is to modulate those two actions and their frequencies and synchronize those from a cellular and a tissue relationship. So in this whole scope, you're interfacing all of a sudden with this really highly sophisticated machine that's regulating your energy output, your movements and your energy on the inside, as well as the way that you're experiencing stress load from outside and your emotions from the inside. So this is like a master controller system that is higher 
up on kind of like the command center of how things are functioning. It would be one of your like master tissues. Like you have your brain and your fascia, which are master tissues. And then the rest of the tissues are kind of like minor. They like do their job and take care of the physiology, but they don't control anything. And so these two master systems, when you can tap into them, are what are really for me exciting because all of a sudden you can start controlling and choosing and selecting your body destiny, your health, your mindsets, your outlooks, your perspectives. That's kind of in a nutshell. What I do and the technology I do is how to work with that choice part of fascia. When I can choose it, it behaves like this and it works like this and I can get this kind of outcome through all my other systems. And the way that you do that is through stretching. Kind of. So, okay, this is, yes. What you see is it okay if I get that technical with you? I mean, it's yeah. not technical, but it gives you an idea. Okay. What's interesting about this smart grid is that it is a metabolizing system, similar to the way your lungs take in air and then the blood flows through your veins and takes out the oxygen. It's a metabolic process. The body's metabolic process for force and energy follows three steps. It generates it macerates and it eliminates, just like when you want to get energy for your food. You take in food to generate energy, you break it down through your digestive system, and then you eliminate it. The same thing's happening in your connective tissue system. What's really interesting is that energy, when it's being generated by your cells, moved into the tissue, animated through your structures, needs a place to eliminate. And what we see as motion is the end result of kinetic breakdown, is kinetic force breakdown. So what's really interesting is that we look at an exercise and we think that we are doing an exercise and using energy. In a way, that's true, but it actually starts inside with the motion of fascia, the way that fascia is taking and modulating the energy, breaking it down. A good example is like most high voltage runs through wires, and when it gets to your house, it steps down and becomes usable in the house for 120 volts. And the same thing is kind of happening in the body is that the body takes in all of this energy from how we're food from internal and external sources, just make it simple. And then fascia breaks this down is what gives us this kinetic energy. So what we see as stretching, what we see as running, what we see as sport is kinetic energy leaving the body that's been digested. And I think that that's really important because instead of it being the first thing that we are doing, it's actually the end thing that's a result of it. So when we start looking at doing fascia body care, it's not that the stretch is activating fascia, it's that we are using fascia to get a, at least I am, I'm not trying to use a stretch to activate fascia, I'm actually using fascia to make the whole body energy efficient to have a huge amount of efficiency. So what you see as GST, ironically, is actually not because we're targeting fascia, it's because we're working with fascia and making an end result. Does that make sense? Yeah, kind of. It's very technical. And I think there's a lot of people out there that might be thinking, oh, I think I'm a little bit lost. But I kind of get what you're saying is that it's a way of kind of treating our body to look after itself better. Is that what you mean? Yes, let me say it this way. What fascia needs is when you create an action and you make yourself do this movement, this is why it's a, a difficult thing. Like most people don't think about what's happening internally, but there is a way to control a mechanism, the way you can choose to breathe, the way you can choose to squeeze your hand together. And this fascia, if you control it, will produce this kind of certain type of motion energy. And so what you see in a stretch should be the end result of that happening. It's called continuum mechanics. So your biomechanics that you're familiar with as, as an athlete mm -hmm. is based on the mechanics of solids, right? Yep. My bone is moving me with the leverage and I'm using this type of leverage and I'm pushing this kind of force to get this to go. Yep. But fascia actually is different. Fascia on a different paradigm works like a fluid. It says that I'm going to... I create motion by first taking in the imprint of energy. The best example is it's like a rock in a pond. If I drop a rock in a pond, continuum mechanics spreads out and deforms the water. The rock drop deforms the water. And then that water pushes out and becomes a displacement of rings in eccentric circles that move out in a pond. Uh -huh. And what Fash is saying is that what human motion is are the ripples in the pond. So what we do in GST is we go back to how we drop the rock in the pond, and then we control that 
aspect of dropping the rock and then we see it as human motion. Does that make sense? Mm. Better? Yeah. And that's why it's like more important. It's a, number one, fascia is a holistic system that you can control. Your nervous system is a holistic system that you can control, but your circulatory system is not. Your digestive system is not a system you can control. So when it comes to taking care of your body, you want to have a system that will allow you to take care of everything holistically. And so fascia allows you to do that. The way it does that is by breaking down and having this energy efficient metabolism. And it looks like motion when you see it coming out. I'm trying to think of like these like very basic analogies, like you can tell what you've eaten by how you've eliminated it, right? Yes. You can tell how well you're breathing by taking a test of the oxygen levels in your, in your exhale, right? How efficient your body is at metabolizing oxygen. So the same thing is true that when you're working with fascia, you can tell how healthy your fascia is and how it moves by watching human motion. So if you see someone walking down the street, can you look at them and see what they're not doing right? Correct. A hundred percent. Okay. You can see exactly where they'd have pain. You can see exactly where they're not breathing. You can tell where they breathe and how the structures are formed because it's coming out in how they inhabit movement. Mm -hmm. It's almost like this too. Like if you want to take out stress from the body, most people like try to stop doing it. They, you'll see this in physiology and it's a big technique of physical therapy is like, if you're in pain, they try to eliminate you doing anything that generates pain. But that's like, you're just trying to turn off the hose, but we need the hose to be running. We need water to be moving through the hose. So I'm going to actually leave the hose running and then teach you how to direct the water so that you can be in com command of it so that you don't start limiting the way that your life needs to be lived. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So if you're sitting on a plane for a really long time, I know definitely my back and everything, but I also have a lot of injuries from basketball. I have, I broke my coccyx bone, so I have a lot of trouble sitting. Oh yeah. And I have four bulge discs in my neck. So for me, oh, nice. yeah, it's not ideal being on a plane for a really, really long time, but I know a lot of people end up with really bad backs and bad necks from being on a plane, especially from Australia. We're on a plane for at least 14 hours direct yeah. most of the time. Yeah. How totally. can people help their body with what you're talking about? Great. Here's the best analogy so people will understand what happens when you sit for so long. Remember I said that fascia is a pseudoplastic, non-Newtonian fluid. It acts like, you know, those snow globes that you get when you're a kid at Christmas? Mm -hmm. When you shake the snow globe, all the snow like becomes light and feathery and has motion. That's like fascia. When you're walking and breathing and moving, your fascia is pretty much fluffed and it doesn't have this compression rate. When you sit in a plane for minimum of like even an hour and a half, two hours, not to mention the 14 hour flight from Australia, <laughs> your fascia literally starts to become like this condensed, very sedentary, heavy substance and the fluids aren't moving. I mean, literally your fascia has a respiratory cycle that should move about every 30 to 45 minutes. Your body should inspire you to move. And you can see this in animals. Animals also have fascia and dogs and cats lay around all day. And within 30 to 40 minutes, they will get up and do some like minimal, we're talking minimal stretches. They do, don't they? They yeah. get up and they stretch their back. And I look and at them they and go, oh, I want to stretch my back. Correct. Correct. And fascia tells you to do that. There's a respite, like this reflex and it says, move me, move me. But most humans have lost that because of our sedentary lifestyles. And because our fascia is already compromised, it's not moving energy like a fluid and it's not actively stretching. And so the first thing to do on a plane is to commit to number one, I have to get up at least every 30 to 40 minutes to restore that reflex. I want to listen to my body and it just seems kind of like an inconvenience because we're tightly packed and we're sausages and who wants my, you know, button your face while I'm trying to stretch or move. Believe me, you're going to be the only one for a very long time. I'm trying to spread the message, but you, the listener, will probably be the only one needing doing this. So don't feel bad and you have to take care of your body. That's the number one thing. My biggest message is know your body, know your body, take care of your body. It's the best thing you'll ever do. And it's more simple than we think. So in an airplane, probably within a good, within the first hour, you're going to want to start moving. The other thing that you can do to create good energy flow is how you're going to sit in the seats. And I do not understand who's designing the ergo ergodynamics of airline seats. I really would love to be hired to do it mm. because they would actually probably take up less room 
and they would be more comfortable because they need to support the flow of energy through the spine. So if you're traveling with a carry-all or something, the best thing that you can do is roll something to put into your low back like a lumbar spine arch. The spine, when it is compressed, does two things. And that's kind of what you were hearing me talk about on the, or the live with Sophia was that taking out lumbar curvature depresses the thoracic spine, which is right where your diaphragm is located. If people can picture a woman's bra line where you're sitting at home, a woman's bra line is about the equal distance from your fingertip to your toe tip. It seems if like it's favoring the upper hemisphere, but if you put your arms up, your body makes one big X. And so this equatorial line, we talk about it. You guys are on the Southern hemisphere and we're on the Northern. Mm -hmm. The body has two uh, two hemispheres and fluid polarity, the way that fascia moves tension through the body works in cycles, much like water flow happens in those polarities on our planet. When you're sitting in an airline seat and you take out the curvature of your lumbar spine, you're compressing your diaphragm, which is right where the polarity of these tensions are trying to move through. Two things happen from a physiological level and not just the physiological meaning, like what's happening electrochemically and biologically in that. When you sit at the same region of your equatorial line is where your adrenals, which are your stress um, organs, and your kidneys sit. And your kidneys are one of your primary organs for detox, but your adrenals are your primary organs of toxification for a good reason. It's trying to put you in fight or flight and fight stress and stuff, but they're put together uh, purposely, I think in good design to balance each other out. But when you're sitting in this plane, you are shutting down the and creating tensions in your diaphragm. So you're not breathing in the physical level, but you're also stressing out your adrenal and kidneys that sit right below it. So you're getting really static. And that's what fascia is supposed to do is create motion to be moving the fluids through your body, which are lymph is for detox and your blood, your respiratory cardiovascular system to move blood cells and oxygen through the system. So when you sit in an airplane for a long period of time, fascia, which governs the flow of those things, becomes sedentary tight and then it starts to affect those other systems which are what you need you need like high immunity you need more oxygen moving through your system for these long flights to help support your circadian rhythms and help the body's fluids move which is your detox system so because the body is compressed and sitting in quite a squished way does yes. that mean that those systems aren't able to filter yes they become sluggish Okay. So they're still working, but they're not working efficiently. Correct. Okay. Not working efficiently. And all of those systems really rely on this connective tissue, right? Because they're all sitting in it. They're the fruit that are sitting in this fascia. So if you can get up every 30 minutes, just simply stretching the fascia like a cat or a dog would is going to give you great reprieve. If you can help set up your posture while you have to be sitting, so that you are also not putting pressure down on your diaphragm and not sinking and smushing your spine into your pelvis would be really great. For someone like you and you have tailbone issues, there's two things you to do. When you're not sleeping on your neck pillow, sit on your neck pillow like a donut and take the pressure off your tailbone. That's exactly what I do. And I also put it behind my lower back to cause that arch because it is so painful that's the only thing I can do that will relieve it but even then it's still not amazing because you're sitting down in these very uncomfortable seats for a very long time you can take some of the magazine articles and wrap them up and I tie them but I have like my hair rubber band on my wrist yep I'll roll them up And you can choose to put that under your sit bones and it will put you into a tilt. So you're also, it's like, instead of using it to your like pillow in your low back, can you picture that you would put it right at the base of your tailbone and it'll make your pelvis kind of tip forward into an arch. And that like, if you put it right right under your bottom, right under your bottom in front of your sit bones, because you're trying to tilt your spine downhill or your pelvis downhill, those seats pull your legs up and push your butt down. And we want to push your butt up and let your legs be angling down. Oh, okay. So I'm just trying to sit here and like picture that I'm putting something under my butt to help make that happen. Let me say it with this and then someone can creatively do it. If you took like a three ring binder and you put the wide edge up where your butt is and then the low edge, it's like a wedge. Uh Uh-huh. 
you're trying to create that angle into your pelvis while you're sitting there. Okay. Yeah, because you like you said, the seat tips you down. That's right. That's what makes them so uncomfortable, isn't it? Horrible. They make them bucket seats and bucket seats are bad. Like it's so funny, all the luxury seats are so bad for you. <laughs> Yeah. Because they think that it's like nice to be cradled, but it's actually like cocooning you. And it's really, really bad. It's very bad. Everyone picks on me in my car because my the, the back of my car seat is back so far because That's right. I, I can't. For you. I, yeah, right. Well, I don't like sitting up and I feel weird. So I need to kind of have a back so I can stretch me out. And That's everyone right. laughs at me and calls me a gangster. <laughs> totally. Well, what you're doing is good. You should be able to do that from your legs, putting your seat back so you have to stretch for your pedals. Mm -hmm. But I totally understand what you're doing. You're trying to lengthen that thing, and that's really smart. Good. I say take, do that. I know exactly what you're talking about, and keep being a gangster girl. You're doing it fine. <laughs> <laughs> gangster that. <laughs> okay, so you can get the magazines, put your hair tie around it, shove that under your butt. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, you're going to look hilarious, but you do whatever it takes to make this happen. Mm -hmm. Then I personally believe in massive traction. I love most airlines in the compartments above where you have all your, you know, carry-ons stowed, have like little places where lights are to show you the way or like highlight the overhead lights. Uh -huh. So you can put your fingers in there and I'll take one on one side of the aisle and one on the other. And then I just hang and traction my body like I'm a splayed out kind of like little like singing bat. If you can picture that, like I put my feet underneath and I'll just hang off my arms like a kid on a jungle gym oh. because fascia really needs two different things. Compression, which I'm, it's another discussion because we're talking about joint compression, which is bad on an airline, compressing your spine, which is joint compression. That's different than fascial compression, which it needs just to be clear. Mm -hmm. But traction is really important for how stress is moved or how tension is moved through your body. And when you sit there over and over and the snowpack adds up and you're feeling tight and restricted in your body, you need to pull it all out. And so hanging off those bins, they're strong enough. No one cares. And on your long flights, people are sleeping. Yes. So start doing that. If you're doing that, aren't you like hanging over people? Aren't there people there? Or can you find a section where there's nobody there? Like at the back is there? Well, there's two ways I do it. One, if I just face only one bin, like let's say I'm facing my seat. Yeah, yeah my butt would be in someone's face. But I'm saying now you're going to be parallel with the aisle. And I put my hands on either side. So I'm gripping over one's head and gripping over my seat. And when I pull back, I'm putting my butt down the aisle. I'm okay. parallel to the aisle. Does that make sense? Uh huh. I do this back when people are sleeping on the really good traction places. And what I should just do is next time I'm flying is have someone videotape me doing this. I haven't flown long distances in a, in a, in a little while, but the rolling carts, when they're locked, are also a really great place to hang off of back where the stewardesses are. And when they're in their seats, usually they don't make a big fuss if you're like kind of in their area. So I will find and be creative. I guess I can give you all the places I do it, yeah. but just look around and be like, where can I traction and pull off of? First, find anywhere you can to traction. My top three places are off of the bins with my butt parallel to the aisle and hanging, just hanging and hanging and taking huge deep breaths and trying to let my organs fall into my pelvis. So does that mean your legs are off the ground? I don't pick them up. I just leave them hanging on the ground like okay. I'm being dragged by them. Okay. Because you don't, I don't pick my knees up because you're trying to not use so much muscle activity. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can, if you want to work out, I guess that would be a good thing, but you're trying to stretch the fascia so you're not really picking up your legs. Okay. I just literally hang my body weight like you would off of a jungle gym. When you travel, life is your jungle gym. You want to look for everything you can traction off of as much as you can. And so then the next place that I would traction is in the back of the plane where there are carts that are locked in. Or sometimes if the stewardesses are walking around, I'll use their chairs, the back of their chairs to hang off of. And I'll sometimes even hang and keep my, and like try to like go into a really deep squat. That's really good for your low back. Okay. Which will help you. Can you kind of picture like being in a, a ball, you're hanging so that your knees are at your chest. Yep. I love that stretch. That's one of my favorites. It's so good. You know where I learned that one, ironically, was from an Australian osteopath. 
I guess it's a really old remedy for preparing the pelvis for pregnancy. So when I work with women in their pregnancy and take them through, we do that a lot uh, to get the pelvis in the right orientation for that. So very good for travel as well. Another thing that you need to do is get your legs up. So when you're sitting in airplanes for a long time, another thing that happens is that you don't have a lot of fluid flowing. And that's why a lot of people will swell because you don't have the gravity, you're up so high in the air, you're stationary, and then the air circulating is not you know, what you're used to. You're not taking deep breaths. And so you've got to get your legs up. This is a little bit more challenging, especially if you're not very flexible. I can bring my knee to my chest and then put my leg up on the back of the seat in front of me. And I will do some stretches that way, trying to take deep breaths and allowing my back and diaphragm to stretch. How does the person in front of you like that? <laughs> they can't ever feel it. They can't when you're pushing on their chair? Well, I, my leg just laying there. Okay. <laughs> you know, if you're like, do you ever sleep and you like just put your knees up on the chair in front of you? Yeah, I guess so. Uh, normally I go, I'm always, I try to go for the window seat. So I try and lean on the side of the window. Okay. Yeah. That's also a good one too. <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, that's great. I always just like tuck my knees up and I mm -hmm. think it's because of my low back hurting. Yeah. So I'm like always bringing my knees up and usually it's like in front of me or you could also take out the tray and it's called a number four stretch, but you could take your leg and lay it on your tray and you can lean forward. And that's a really nice stretch just to get your legs up. Hold on, hold on. My visual right now is so probably not what you're explaining. <laughs> okay. Let's slow that down. You pull your tray down and you get your leg over the top of it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I take my shin and I lay it out. You know those old, in basketball you did this. They're called number four stretches where you cross your ankle over your knee and you pull it into your chest. Oh, yes. To stretch your glute. Okay. So you're making that same shape. You're taking your shin and you lay it on the table or the tray. If you're not flexible enough, you could do it over your knee. That's fine too. Like put your foot on the ground and take your right leg and put it on your right ankle and put it over your left knee. And then you just stretch forward. Okay. I'm doing this while, while we're speaking, by the way. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. So you can ask questions. <laughs> and you can go and lean forward and put your hands up and over. And you can gently pull on the person's seat in front of you. They don't care. Just don't kick them. And you reach forward and you try oh, to- Oh, don't grab their hair. <laughs> Oh, that's what my little girls do. It's oh, embarrassing. So embarrassing. <laughs> do be, you know, conscientious of the people around you. This is not a time to be selfish, but it is a time to take care of yourself. Be considerate of the people around you, but be creative. Like, I think the thing that most people lack is just the creativity. Yes. Feel what your body needs and then be creative. Like, okay, I'm going to have to go to the back where there isn't someone sitting. Put your leg up on an armchair of an empty seat and do a lunge. And then stretch your arms out behind your chest and you're going to like free up your diaphragm. That would be just perfect for you. Then no one is there and they're doing it and you're opening your chest and you're taking deep breaths. Another thing that I said, this is a little bit harder because you can't spin, but I think one of the things you saw with Sophia Bush was like when you're in an airport, you know, I'm focusing everything while you're in a confined space on the airplane, which is where this is tough on long flights. Yeah. But like, if you're in the airplane, like go and stand and then just start doing old fashioned, like windmills with your arm, twisting your torso. That's going to open up your diaphragm and start creating a release of all of the tensions all the way through the body. And it starts motility, which is a whole nother conversation, but organ motility helps your immune system be able to be in working order. So when you travel, one of the prominent things is not just like the physical strain and stress of sitting so long, straight stressing on your immune system. And so one of the ways to support that is to get flow in your lymph and good oxygen. So when you're in the airport, you can even do deep breaths. I did a little bit of research. I'm going to read you these two fascinating things. They say that the recycled air in airplanes is actually not as bad as you think. And it's actually better in an airplane than it is in your office. Oh, okay. And so research is indicating that you need to be sitting really close to a sick passenger, usually within two rows, for longer than eight hours to significantly increase your chances. So if you got sick, it's probably your fault, meaning your immune system was already not beefed up. Why is that cool? Because I'm being able to teach you the couple things to do to actually boost your own immunity. So then you're not worried about the girl who's sneezing next to you if it's a two-hour flight because that shouldn't really influence you that much unless she gets her snot on you. Oh my gosh, this is so interesting because I always say, oh, everybody gets sick on the way back from anywhere because you're in a germ fest field for so many hours. 
but maybe yeah. that's not what it is. It's your body is compromised, especially on the way back from traveling because you're tired. That's right. It's totally that. It's basically the same message of there's stuff you can do and take ownership out of your own stuff. It's not the person's fault that they're making you sick. It's probably that you're already have a compromised immune system. And they say, you know, the heightened risk of infection when you enter this confined space, like an aircraft or a subway, but the plane is much safer because of their ventilation system. And they say that this is interesting. On average, a cabin air is re completely refreshed 20 times in an hour. That's compared with just 12 times in an office building an hour. Wow. The air is cycled differently. On most aircrafts, air is also circulated through hospital grade HEPA filters, which removes 99.97% of bacteria, as well as the airborne particles that viruses use for transport. I just had to pick my jaw up from the ground. Those facts yeah. are blowing my mind. That is not Isn't how I thought it worked on a plane. I just thought it was the same air going around and around and around. Yeah, no, it's filtered and they do it by section. I was reading that depending on the size and stuff, they have like filters for every 50 people or something like they make these sections. And so there's filters for every single section. In essence, they're doing everything they can to make this a really inhabitable, except for their chairs, <laughs> inhabitable environment. And that's why it comes down to like, here's some like, be a smart traveler. And that's kind of goes along with your message of like, you can travel as a woman, no problem. Just be a really savvy traveler, like take care of yourself, like know, know yourself and have confidence. And the world isn't also a very scary place. The airplane is not this necessarily horrible place. It's not a big germ filled <laughs> place that I thought it was. Yeah. Well, and it, I mean, it is, you're really with a ton of people, especially these flights that like pack in your eight rows wide. Uh -huh. It's crazy that what they fit in and it's, it's amazing. Uh, it wasn't as bad as I thought either. And that comes down to just get your lymph moving when you're in the airport and somehow on the plane, do basic stretches, get your fascia to stretch every hour, especially focusing on your diaphragm region, which is responsible for the stress response in the body, which compromises. Do some breathing, get your lungs actually moving so that you can cycle this air. I think sometimes people get so scared about breathing in an airplane, go into a back corner that's probably pretty fresh and just breathe. Do like 16 deep breaths and then move on is, a, is another way to do it. I'm thinking of all the systems that are taxed while traveling mm. that you can control. So I'm just kind of going through those now. Okay, so when you're talking about getting your lymph moving, you're talking about moving your arms from side to side and kind of swaying your body. Is that what you mean? Yes. You can do it side to side or front and back. Okay. I'm going to give you instructions. Yes, please. Okay. And this is going to be for the airport. And then you can be creative with how you're going to make the same motions in an airplane. Okay. I'm going to ask you guys to be creative. So when you're standing in an airport, you're going to stand with your arms wide, legs and arms wide, kind of like a scarecrow. Yep. And then you're going to twist your spine from right to left, keeping your arms out. And you want to let your arms kind of come and hit your chest. It's almost like water sprinkler in the summer that's attached to a hose and it sprays out water. You want your arms to spray out because of how your torso is moving. Does okay. that make sense? So you're not carrying your arms. One of the things that fluids need is kind of a centrifuge pull. Like it has to pull the blood to your fingertips. It has to pull the lymph. That's why you don't want to carry your arms like a workout. You want them to just kind of wave in the breeze. Okay. So you're going to twist right and left, and you're going to look to the right and left and let your head move because you have lymph up in, your head, up in your throat. And you're going to kind of let your eyes roll to the right and left. And then you're going to take deep breaths as you're washing. And it feels good in your spine, but you want to stretch your lungs. So you inhale as you're doing it, and then you can just exhale and let it all out. Inhale and exhale. I'm doing it with you so I can tell you exactly what I'm experiencing. Inhale and exhale. You take these big breaths and what you're doing is re-oxygenating the blood and the twisting of the spine and the muscles start to act like a, a pump that push and pull the lymph fluids through the system. When your arms are coming across and hitting you, you have high lymph in your armpits, but you also, where the lymph is purified and then changes over, goes through a valve in your collarbones. So if your arm can come across and hit you in the collarbone, kind of like a peck hit, then you're actually also adding a, it's called a percussion to the lymph nodes. And that will start to push them through because the lymph system doesn't have a pump like the cardiovascular system of the heart. Mm -hmm. The lymph rely on the movement of your fascia and the muscles to push the lymph through. 
That's okay. why movement is so important. So is that that noise that you're making right now? Is that you hitting your chest? That was hilarious. No, that was me hitting my hand like a pump. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> I've got this idea that you're like sitting there hitting yourself right now. <laughs> And it kind of does. I mean, you can hit your chest. That's another one for immunity is like take your hands into a fist and just pump your chest. Now you can hear it. Can you hear that? Uh huh. You pump across your chest like you're drumming on it. Really, really, really good for heart and lung pulmonary circulation of the oxygen through your system. Okay. So that, that can be done while you're sitting in your seat. That also could be done while you're sitting in your seat. Yes. Good. And then I was thinking, like, if you're in the airport, and you can also look for this other places, go to a empty kiosk that is not manned by attendants and pull off of it first. Do some traction off the countertop height. It'll feel really good. You just got to pull your butt back, keep your feet stationary, holding on to the thing. And it feels like you're kind of, if you've ever water skied, you're kind of assuming the water ski position as you're trying to come out of the water. There's also like rails normally around the side of the airport. Would that work as well? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Perfect. You look for life to be your jungle gym. Anything I can hang off of. I do it off of chairs. I do it everywhere. But the reason I thought about that is that my next suggestion is holding on now standing to your kiosk, swing your legs, swing them forward and back, kick, kick, kick as much as you can and just get blood to flow of your leg forward and back. It doesn't matter if your leg is straight or bent. You're trying to do the same pendular force in your legs Mm -hmm. to keep fluid moving in the lower hemisphere. Remember I said that the polarities of the hemispheres move in different directions, fluids and stress. Try to find ways to do stuff in your upper hemisphere and your lower hemisphere of the body. And what about the face? Okay, so a couple things that are really nice for the face. Number one, you have lymph, two lymph things that sit right behind your cheekbones. So if you push on your cheekbones, they tend to be a little bit tender. But what's nice for the face is number one, two, I call it the blowfish. And the face is constantly held close to the skeletal system. And it's really nice to get your face to actually stretch out. So I put my mouth on my thumb. Do this maybe if you're really an insecure person or if you're really kind of self-conscious, maybe not insecure. Well, I was too for years. I didn't do this, but I started all of these things when I was traveling around the world on my honeymoon. So you're going to put your mouth on kind of the like thumb bone base where it connects to your hand Uh and you make a seal around your mouth to that bone. And then you're going to blow air into your cheeks like a blowfish. And you want to make sure that you can still breathe through your nose. And then you're going to blow again and try to get it bigger. And you're going to feel a stretch underneath your eyes. This is for sleepy, tired eyes. While you do it, and it also starts to lift the lymph underneath that cheekbone. Feels good, but it's a stretch that's going to help oxygen fill your face because a lot of times the dehydration, and I said that those lymph right under your cheekbones tend to drain, well, first straight into your throat. And that's a really susceptible area where we tend to get sick because it also happens to be the orifices of saliva and mucosi, big membranes in those areas. And then you stretch or stretch, and then you can let it go. And you'll do this like three or four, five times. Then the second one that I was going to give you, you're going to take your right hand and place it on your knee. You're going to kind of move to the front of your airline seat, and you're going to hang back off your right arm. You'll do this both sides, but I'm going to direct you from your right arm. And this is to start getting stretched through your neck up into the lymph right under your jaw. So you're going to hang back off your arm, and it kind of gives you this, it kind of feels like you're pulling your arm out of the socket. And then you're going to take and turn your head to look left as far as you can. You're going to get a neck stretch all the way up to your face. And then you're going to take your face and stretch it to your left ear. And you're going to feel a pull across your face through to your arm. If you can picture a line from your hand to your shoulder, to your jaw, to your kiss. I call it like a Popeye kiss where you Mm -hmm. kiss forward and then you stretch your lips to your left. And you'll get a stretch through the, it's a muscle called your ECM and your scalenes and people from sitting, those neck muscles pull down and they get really stressed and they put strain on the lymph right under your jaw. Uh So that's a stretch for your jaw lymph and moving it down. And you can kind of just hang and pulse. If you want extra sensation, take your left hand and put it on your chest. And if you pull down slightly, you'll increase the amount of stretch that you get through your face. That will give you more more pull through your chest. You're trying to increase the length from your arm that's on your knee, hanging back and stretching all the way through your head, looking left. And then you can do it to the other side. And that starts to open up the lymph underneath your jaw, behind your ear, and it just feels good into your temple and face. 
Then you're gonna take your two thumbs and you're going to go to the back of your skull, right where your hairline is at the nape of your neck. Okay. Most people do not push very hard, but you wanna use your thumbs, not against the muscles, but against your bones. And you're gonna to try to collect the scruff of your neck, kind of like a puppy would, by pushing your thumbs against the occipital lobe. And you're gonna push them from wide at your ears to moving narrow at your spine. Oh, I love that. And then moving to the narrow of your spine. And then for most people, it'd be nice to roll your eyes in their sockets down to look towards your chin because you're lengthening the cervical spine. So you know how we talked a lot about the lumbar spine? Mm -hmm. The cervical spine is just as compromised because they're complementary opposites in terms of structures. So when you sit and your butt's under you, you're simultaneously stressing out the cervical spine. So this is really good for opening that up. And you can go ahead and take your arm, your hands now and work down from that bone and just rub your neck muscles into your spine. You're using your spine, and this is kind of a technique of GSTs, which is we use the skeletal system as the washboard, kind of like the old fashioned washboard mm -hmm. to loosen tensions against. That's how fascia orients itself. So instead of trying to rub a muscle like you would in a massage, where they're squeezing the top layers, you wanna actually wash the muscles against your bones. So as you take your fingers down from that occipital lobe and kind of squeeze your neck on either side, pulls those tight muscles into your bones and you're sim uh, simultaneously moving lymph, but it feels nice to take that tension out of the cervical spine. Mm, okay. Next one, take your two fingers and you're gonna place it to the, just to the outsides of your eyebrows. And you're going to just push in and you're going to hold for 10 seconds. And as you do, you're going to let your eyes cross over and try to pass the tension through the center of your brow. So my hands are to the soft temples, right to the outsides of my eyebrows. And it could be a little bit tender in there. And again, you're pushing into the bones. My eyes are closed and I let my eyes cross like they're looking towards the opposite fingers. So your actual eyeballs, you mean like where you're trying to look? Yes. Your eyeballs do muscular patterning and trigger the same responses in the brain as fascia and, my, and the uh, muscular actions in the body. So we use animation of tissue to create flow. So when you use your eyes, it takes the tension that you're generating and helps to move it through the system. So with that, you're getting your thumbs and you're pushing them towards your ears. Is that, that what we're doing? You can either use your fingers or your, sorry, fingers or your thumbs, but I'm just pushing them in on each other, kind of like your like a vice grip against oh, your Oh, so bones. you're not actually moving. You're just pushing in like a pressure point. I'm just point. pushing in like a pressure point. That's okay. right. But then you're creating motion by crossing your eyes and looking down into those cheekbones. I'm with you. I'm with you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Idea, I got it. Okay. Because <laughs> we're going to do the complementary opposite one now, where you're going to take your thumbs and place them right in the socket of the inside where your nose and your eyeballs meet. Oh, so okay. you know when you like get a headache and you'll just pinch right there, or if you have a sinus headache, I'm putting them so go to the bridge of your nose, yeah. and then your thumbs should fit right into the eye bed sockets. Oh, yeah. And you push into those same pressure points. And then as you do this, two things. You want to try to lengthen your neck in the back so that you're not overly collecting stress back in your neck. And then you're going to roll your eyes back down and in. Oh, my hands just want to move. My hands want to move instead of staying still. <laughs> you're allowed to. That's what I was going to say. Oh, okay. First, apply the pressure. Mm -hmm. And then after you use your eyes, move your, eyes, your hands along your brow line. It's kind of your, but you're on the bone. Don't think about being on the eyebrow because that's too high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's under the socket. Oh, this and then feels just, good. I like this. Those are two complementary compression stretches that really help to ease tension in the face and the skull. And ironically, so right behind where you're pressing is your pituitary gland and right above it is your pineal gland. That was the last one I was gonna give you is a stress release right where the pineal gland is. And those are glands, they're part of your endocrine system and they help to regulate circadian rhythms. And this is another thing of travel, that when mm -hmm. you travel, time zones and light and dark all get messed up. And that's another reason that there's so much problems with jet lag is that there's a change in the circadian rhythms. 
and how they sync up. So if you can support those through some of these stress zones, and if you're having a hard time falling asleep, this is actually really relaxing and will help you sleep better. I can't stop doing this one. This one feels so nice. <laughs> they all feel really good to me, but. <laughs> oh no, this one, this one, I don't know. Maybe I had a lot of stress in around my eyes. This one good. feels the best. Do it over and over again. It should just be something that you're like inclined to do. So that's really, really good. <laughs> the last one that I was going to do is up at the pineal gland, which is a little bit higher on the forehead. So take your two index fingers and put them together and In take your two thumbs. Yeah, well, just look at them. Oh, I'm okay. going to walk you through it this way. All right. And then take your two thumbs out wide and you kind of have like a, di a W shape. A W shape. Oh, okay. Hold on. No, my thumbs are together? No. So your two in pointer fingers are together and your two thumbs are wide. Wide. Yes. Just open them. Oh, okay. Facing me. Yes. And now you're going to put your, put your fingers on the widow's peak where, hair, where the hairline is in the center. Uh-huh. And you're going to take your thumbs back onto those temples. Uh-huh. Okay. And then you're going to start to pull your scalp back as hard as you can. And you're actually trying to move into your hair and draw your fingers towards one another at the top of your head, pulling, 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 pulling. Oh yeah. And as you do that, you kind of let a smile come across your jaw uh -huh. so that it's moving with, cause you want to loosen that hold on your scalp and you're kind of pulling in through the skin and trying to collect your scalp right up at the top of your head. It feels really good when you do that and you inhale. Those hit the, like the endocrine, circadian, sleep, relaxation, a uh, lymph clearing. So how often should you do that on the plane? I would do it like once an hour. Mm, okay. Because you need to be responding. The whole point about GST and fascia, what it's, what I'm passionate about it is, is supporting the body's needs holistically. It gives you this totally new way. And so if the body says drink water, we drink water. And if the body says eat, we should eat. And if the body says stretch, if the body says move, it has a reflex, then we need to do that. And these are all ways that we do it. And hopefully the more people do these little things like tractioning and swinging and pulling, they'll bring their reflex back online. Like I said, most people, their snow is just like sedentary. Their fascia is just so sedentary that they don't have the inspiration. The body doesn't kick them anymore. It's kind of lost the reflex. So if you can do these things, you'll probably start craving them and it won't be like, oh, I have to do this 14 times. Yeah. Good God, that seems like a lot of effort. You'll want to do it. Yeah, totally. I can't stop. I can't stop touching my face now. <laughs> Good. <laughs> you just touch your face, girl. You just touch it all over. <laughs> so funny. You really like the traction stretches too. Yeah, well, I've been doing them anyway because I've, I've watched, I did all of your, so on your website, you have a section where you can download like a free pack. Yeah. So I've done that and I, I have been doing some of the stretches from that. Oh, great. I always feel like I want to give more and more and more. And so I'm like, I wanted to give tools that people just have at their house. Like if you have a jump rope, you can like traction using it and like stretch your legs using it. And so I'm going to try to do some videos for you there too. So you've just re-inspired my need to do that because you're doing basic stretches. You don't have our equipment, yes. right? Yeah. Yeah. So the other question I have for you is on the plane, we have neck pillows. What is the mm -hmm. best way to look after our necks while we're trying to sleep? Because it is really hard. I know. You know, I hate planes because I never sleep on them ever. I just never do. I, I think the, the biggest thing is I, I don't really know. I, I, that's why it's like, listen to your body and choose something that fits it for a little while and then switch it. Okay. I'll give you three positions that I tend to alternate between. Now they're really nice that they will add like kind of visors on the side of planes sometimes where you yes. can pull them out and have that. That's helpful. I'll use a neck pillow, but sometimes I have to like beef it up. They're never thick enough to really like give you the lift that you need. Mm. I, I tend to bounce it on, on itself. So I use it yeah. on one side. It and yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Oh, see, this is, you, you, you do this. You do this. This is great. <laughs> That's excellent. That's what I was going to say. It's just like layer it up. Or I'll do my pillow stuffing. I don't know if you've seen the Instagram information on sleeping. I did, and I tried it, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't cope with it. I don't know. Maybe I wasn't doing it right, but I do have neck issues. Well, you can take, the, you can take extra blankets and use them to beef it out. You can use the stuffing method. 
then I oftentimes will lean forward from my hips and just sleep for like a good 30 minutes on my table Uh and lean forward because it stretches my spine and it gives me a hamstring stretch. The other thing I'll do is if I don't have a side window, I'll pull up an arm, arm armrest, and I'll try to build the distance between the armrest, the peak of it, to the side of the like wing that comes out on the top. I'll use my forehead on the wing and then I'll have my neck pillow and then I'll build up from the armrest. Like, and I can put my arm up on it, which kind of imitates me lying on my side with my arm. Try it. It depends on that one is tough just because of the Mm -hmm. height of your torso. So if you're a tall woman and you have like, you know, a long spine, that armrest is never going to probably come up high enough unless you slink down into your seat. Yeah. Do you see that? The, the, the proportions I'm only five, six, it, it matches my proportions well enough. And then I oftentimes like will not store my, my carry ons under the chair in front of me on long flights. I use them in my back or I'll put them in the walkway, not, not the aisle, but like, you know, the seat. I'll move it out so that my legs can go under the seat in front of me. Mm-hmm. And I do like a paddle stretch with my legs. And that makes it at least as reclined as I can get it. Because I try to get my feet all the way to the front of the next person's seat. I do that too. <laughs> I try it. And then sometimes I've actually even hit their foot. And I'm like, oopsie, sorry. Yeah. But you just need totally. to stretch it as much as you can, especially on those long flights. Oh, they were a killer. So And everything is a long flight from Australia. Everything. Sure is. <laughs> Actually, you grew up in Australia. I did, part-time. My dad was an economics professor and went and took sabbaticals there at various times. So we lived in like Hobart, Tasmania, and then up on the Gold Coast and spent time in Adelaide and Perth. And I'm, I'm, I love your country. It's really fun. Where's your favorite place in Australia? Where is my favorite place? There's one place that you should be saying. <laughs> I know. Melbourne. Yes, Only yes, Melbourne. of course. <laughs> That's really funny. Only Melbourne. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love Melbourne's the best. culture life. I think Melbourne's cultural life actually, to me, is more fun than Sydney. I don't know what's what's not to like. I mean, I love the beaches of the goal of the Gold Coast are part, you know, like phenomenal. I love, you know, Cairns really up north is just beautiful. <laughs> it's like another world of being up there. I don't know that I could choose a favorite place in Australia. Well, I've picked it for you. It's definitely Melbourne. <laughs> okay, great. I'm so glad you chose that for me because that was really that was really a hard choice. I needed help with that one for sure. <laughs> have you ever ridden the train across Australia from I Adelaide? Have not. Or- you know, something that's always interesting is that I find a lot of people have seen more of other countries than their own, and I've actually seen more of the U.S. than I have of Australia. I absolutely believe that. I would, you know, I know only really the west side of America and haven't spent much in the east at all or south for for that matter. So it's really interesting. It's a good reminder to do that because these countries are really neat. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. You do run classes in LA. Can you just talk quickly a little bit about the classes that you run and what people could do if they do live in LA? Yeah. If you are in LA, come join us for classes. They're really fun. We kind of divide our classes by three different products because of what we do. So you can come in for a movement medicine, which is our answer to physical therapy and rehab. It's our uh, way of treating and healing the compromised or the injured body. And those are slow and wonderful and feel really good. If you are a fitness enthusiast and you want to just peak your aptitude and your body's ability and work on your aesthetics and athletics come in. We have a product called conscious conditioning, which is a little bit more rigorous and it's for the fit body that just wants to look and feel great. And then we have an anti-aging class, which is for anybody at any age. It's not really geriatric in such. It's more a holistic, like that's where we do a lot to target the lymph and all the different systems of the neurology of aging, the face uh, exercises that we do for aesthetics, because I also have a problem with vanity. I I want things to be beautiful as well as functional. So um, the anti-aging class is really great for people who just want to invest in long-term body care. And you also have some for online as well on the website. You can find every single one of those online. Look for movement medicine, conscious conditioning, or anti-aging in our remote membership. And we're trying to beef up exercises so you can just use things that you have at home. But we also, I would encourage you to look at our, not to promote my products, but 
the traction straps feel so good. There's nothing out there that gives you the traction that fashion needs in the quite the same way. So if you like those initial and try the free videos first and they feel good, the strap that we have actually is designed to travel. So you can do it in any door in any country. And we're collecting all these really fun photos of people being like in Kenya and hanging in Hawaii and doing all of their body care. And that might be something that's, oh, you know what would be really good? You could actually, I never thought about this before. You could use a strap or if you travel, like this all came about because a man was traveling, ironically, and wanted to take GST with him. And he had a jump rope. He said, I have to travel light. I'm gone six months. And he had a jump rope. So I came up with all these exercises on a jump rope Mm -hmm. for him to be able to travel with. But if you have like a rope or something, you can put it into like the bathroom door and it will give you an immediate place where you can traction in the airplane. So that's another thought because that will give you all you need. Awesome. We are approaching our destination. Ladies and gentlemen, please fasten your seatbelts for the final five. Your favorite city or town? Oh, man. I really, really like my time in Florence. That might be one of my favorite places. Florence. Weirdest food you've ever eaten? What are those called? We were had to, they're Australian. <laughs> A witchetty grub. Uh, there you go. I was going to say a witchetty grub. It was so gross. I know, a witchetty grub. It was, you know what? It wasn't actually that gross. The texture, I really had to get over. <laughs> yeah, and the look of them, they're not, they're not ideal. Yeah. No, so that was an interesting um, go-to. Not to make people gross, but I have had zebra, which is interesting. When we traveled in Africa, they had this like amazing wild game restaurant. Beaches or mountains? Mountains, I would have to say, but I purposely live in LA because I have access within two hours to both because I just love nature of all kinds. A tourist site that you recommend is a must-see. I mean, on the top of the list would probably be the Great Wall of China. I was very surprised and amazed by that. But don't go to the really popular places. We went to a really remote location and drove quite a while to get there. Mm -hmm. I think other than that, it was so amazing to take a boat ride down the river from Bagan in Myanmar to Yangon. And it was unbelievable. And the nature and the beauty was very unique and special. Bagan has really got amazing with their temples. So that might be another natural wonder that was amazing. Mm. Can you say thank you in another language? Yes, I can. Merci beaucoup. Danke. Grazie. That is fabulous. I think I might have to get you back on to talk about all your other travels because we haven't really spoken about what you've personally traveled with. I might have to get you back. I would be honored. It has been such a fun time talking with you, Michelle. And I do feel like we're kindred spirits and I appreciate who you are and what you're giving to the world. Oh, thank you. And I have such an intellectual crush on you. I can't (laughs) stop watching all of your stuff. And I can't stop doing it and I love it. So I would love to have you back on any time to talk all about your other travels. And I hope everybody has enjoyed and been able to take away the tips that you've shared today because I think they're really helpful. Thanks. I hope they came across clear. It's a complex new subject, but thanks for listening and thanks for having me on. That's okay. I'm going to put some stuff on Instagram. You can also follow Anna's Instagram and Sophia Bush also has some IG stories there that you can go and watch of things that they've done in the past and it will make a little bit more sense to everybody if you go do that as well. So thank you so much for joining me today. You're so welcome. Thanks for listening to With You Every Step, hosted by Michelle Lee. We do hope you enjoyed listening. And if you did, make sure you tell everybody. If you didn't, nobody likes a Debbie Downer. Please subscribe to get up to date with our latest releases and give us a thumbs up on our social media at With You Every Step. We love to hear from you. If you have any questions or inquiries, head to the Contact Us page at our website, michellelee.com. That's also where you'll find all our blogs mentioned in the podcast. We love to hear from you and if we have inspired you to travel. Thanks for listening. Love life and adventure on.